Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to the second and final part of topic 3.3.4.1, mass transport in animals from the AQA A-level biology specification. In part one, we looked at the role of haemoglobin in transporting oxygen in the blood. But in this video, we'll move on to the general pattern of blood circulation in a mammal. Then we'll have a look at the structure of the human heart as well as the pressure and volume changes and associated valve movements during the cardiac cycle. We'll also need to know the structure of arteries, arterioles and veins in relation to their function. And then finally, we'll have a look at the structure of capillaries and the importance of capillary beds as exchange surfaces, as well as the formation of tissue fluid and its return to the circulatory system. So let's start off by looking at the circulatory system. Multicellular organisms have a low surface area to volume ratio. Therefore, we need specialised transport systems to carry materials around the body. You need to know this diagram. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, and I like to remember it in the way that the word artery starts with the letter A, which stands for away. Anything that transports blood away from the heart is an artery. This rule also applies to the renal artery and the pulmonary artery, both which carry blood away from the heart. There are two main types of circulation, pulmonary and systemic. Pulmonary circulation transports blood to the lungs and systemic circulation transports blood to the tissues. Note that the circulatory system is closed, meaning that the transport medium is confined to vessels. In the body, we have something known as the double circulatory system, meaning that blood goes through the heart twice in one cycle. The fact that we have a double circulatory system with a four chambered heart means that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood do not mix, making the transport system much more efficient. The specification now wants us to have a look at the gross structure of the human heart. Heart diagrams and also diagrams of other organs are always portrayed as they would be viewed by an observer looking at the person front on. So the right half of the diagram is actually portraying the left side of the heart and the left half of the diagram is portraying the right side of the heart. So if we start by looking at the left half of the diagram, which is portraying the right side of the human heart, we have the vena cava, which brings deoxygenated blood from the body to the heart. Blood enters the heart at the right atrium, which is connected to the right ventricle via the right atrioventricular valve. The right semilunar valve then allows blood to flow from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, which carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. On the other side, oxygenated blood enters the heart via the pulmonary vein. It first enters the left atrium, is forced through the left atrioventricular valve into the left ventricle, and then passes into the aorta via the left semilunar valve. Always be very specific with your labeling in exams. So, don't just say atrioventricular valve. You have to be specific and say it's the right atrioventricular valve. Or don't just say ventricle, state that it's either the right or the left ventricle. Mark schemes are sometimes a bit more lenient, sometimes a bit more harsh. So I would say just to be on the safe side, always state which side of the heart we are referring to. So how is the heart adapted to allow blood to flow through it quickly and efficiently whilst also being able to resist high pressures? The left ventricle has walls that are thicker and more muscular than the right ventricle because it needs to contract more powerfully and generate higher pressures to pump blood all the way around the body. The ventricles have thicker walls than the atria as they have to force blood out of the heart. Atria just need to force blood into the ventricles, which is a smaller distance. Valves only open one way, and whenever there is higher pressure behind the valve, the valve opens. If the pressure is higher in front of the valve, it is forced to close. 
Valves prevent that flow, meaning that blood only flows through the heart in one direction. Note that the heart is made up of cardiac muscle. This is made of cells called myocytes, which contract when they receive an electrical impulse, causing a heartbeat. Cardiac muscle is myogenic, meaning that it can contract on its own without nerve impulses from the brain. So let's look at the cardiac cycle. Contractions are initiated by the sinoatrial node, also known as the SAN or pacemaker. This is located in the right atrium. First of all, the SAN generates a wave of signals to contract. The signals are then delayed at the atrioventricular node. The signal passes to the heart apex and then signals are spread throughout the ventricles. So let's look at the pressure and volume changes during the cardiac cycle. First, the ventricles relax and the atria contract. This means that the volume of the atria decreases and the pressure in the atria increases, meaning that blood is forced into the ventricles. Next, the ventricles contract and the atria relax. The volume of the ventricles decreases and the pressure in the ventricles increases. Because the pressure in the ventricles is now higher than in the atria, the atrioventricular valves shut. Because the pressure in the ventricles is also higher than that in the aorta and pulmonary arteries, the semilunar valves open, meaning that blood flows into these arteries. The volume of the atria increases and the pressure decreases. Finally, both the ventricles and the atria relax. The volume of the ventricles increases and the pressure in the ventricles decreases. Due to there being a lower pressure in the ventricles than in the atria, the atrioventricular valves open and blood flows passively into the ventricles. The semilunar valves also close due to a higher pressure in the pulmonary artery and the aorta. The atria refill due to a higher pressure in the vena cava and pulmonary vein. Next we have to look at the blood and different types of blood vessels. So blood is made up of plasma liquid, which is a dilute solution of substances such as salts, glucose, amino acids, vitamins, urea, proteins, and fats. Blood also contains white blood cells, which are involved in the immune response. Platelets are involved in blood clotting and red blood cells transport oxygen to respiring tissues. The blood has multiple useful functions. It's involved in transport, it helps maintain body temperature, it buffers pH, it helps the body defend against pathogens, and is also involved in the regulation of body fluid electrolytes. So let's move on to the different types of blood vessel. First of all, we have arteries and arterioles. Arterioles are smaller arteries which connect to capillaries. Arteries and arterioles carry blood away from the heart to tissues. They have a smaller lumen as well as thick walls with smooth elastic layers to resist the high pressures. The folded endothelium means that the artery can stretch and a thick muscle layer helps aid pumping. Arterioles contain many muscular fibers which can constrict to reduce blood flow or dilate to allow blood flow. Pressure in the arteries and arterioles is high and blood is oxygenated apart from in the pulmonary artery because remember the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs. Next we have capillaries which allow the exchange of materials between the blood and cells via the tissue fluid which all cells are surrounded by. The capillary endothelium is only one cell thick, allowing a fast rate of exchange of substances between the blood and the tissue fluid. Capillaries form capillary beds, which are interweaving networks of capillaries at organs and tissues, providing a large surface area for the exchange of substances. They are found near cells in exchange tissues, again providing a short diffusion path for the exchange of substances. 
blood pressure falls in the capillaries and also changes from being oxygenated to deoxygenated, apart from at the lungs. Finally, we have veins, which carry blood from tissues to the heart. When compared to arteries, veins have a larger lumen, a thinner muscle wall, a thinner endothelium, and a thinner wall. There is little muscle and elastic tissue, and there are also valves which prevent backflow. Blood flow through the veins is facilitated by the contraction of body muscles around them. The blood pressure in the veins is low and the blood is deoxygenated, apart from in the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. Finally, we need to consider tissue fluid. Tissue fluid is the fluid that surrounds cells in tissues. In a capillary bed, substances move out of capillaries into the tissue fluid by pressure filtration. Tissue fluid contains substances such as oxygen, CO2, water, glucose, nutrients and hormones. So basically, tissue fluid contains the same substances as blood plasma just without red blood cells and large proteins, which are too large to pass through the capillary endothelium and enter the tissue fluid. Cells take in oxygen and nutrients, exchanging them for waste products. There are two main forces involved in the formation and draining of tissue fluid. First of all, hydrostatic pressure. At the arterial end of the capillary, the hydrostatic pressure is higher than the hydrostatic pressure in the tissue fluid. This means that fluid is forced out of the blood and the hydrostatic pressure decreases as the blood loses in volume. Next we have osmosis. The water potential at the venial end of the capillary decreases due to a lower blood volume as well as an increase in the concentration of large proteins which were too large to leave the blood. The water potential of the venial end of the capillaries is less than the water potential of the tissue fluid, meaning that water re-enters the capillaries by osmosis. Substances such as CO2, urea and salts enter the blood by diffusion. Note that excess tissue fluid, as well as some molecules that are too large to enter the blood, are drained into the lymphatic system by lymph vessels. This transports them back into the blood. Great, so we've had a look at the pattern of blood circulation in a mammal, the gross structure of the human heart, and the pressure and volume changes, as well as valve movements during the cardiac cycle. We've also covered the structure of arteries, arterioles, and veins in relation to their function, as well as the structure of capillaries and the importance of capillary beds as exchange surfaces. Finally, we've also looked at how tissue fluid is formed and its return to the circulatory system. That would be it for now. Thanks guys for watching. Comment, add any suggestions, ideas. Next time we'll be looking at mass transport in plants.